one thing that uh, I think you have the record on for the guests I've contacted so far, I think you've been the fastest with email. Is oh, that is that's that very always the unusual. case? You were just very, you were just very lucky. I think you're just extremely, <laughs> extremely lucky uh, okay. to be looking at a computer at the time. Yeah, other people will not have had a similar experience. Yeah. Okay, okay. So that's. <laughs> I was, I was going to ask like how you managed to do that, but I guess it was just a oh, pure luck, cool pure instance. luck, yeah. pure luck. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let's just pretend you're very good. And all <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have told you. Yeah, I'm totally on top of things. Yeah, totally on top of things. yeah the important thing is to schedule when you do. Yeah, yeah not in the slightest. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I mentioned before we started recording, I, you know, I've read your book, Science Fictions, and that's mainly what I want to talk about, and I'm not familiar with the main research. Interestingly, though, whilst reading Science Fictions, I realized I have heard of one of your studies, hmm. which is, so in, for context, I did my undergraduate goldsmiths college and in about oh. 2012 i believe i think it was 2012 i was helping chris french with his ah. halloween challenge right. so that's uh so he does animalistic psychology kind of trying to explain why people might think they had some sort of animalistic experience um, and try and explain it with psychological principles and he has this halloween challenge where he invites someone in who says they're clairvoyant or something and he says okay make your predictions, we'll test them in a kind of more rigorous way. And as we were kind of, I was just helping out with that. And as we were, um, you know, setting up the thing and sort of in some context, he then mentioned, yeah, we would, we, this is like real problem right now, kind of with um, publishing replications, because we've, yeah. you know, we've run this study about trying to replicate BEM's results and the original journal didn't want to publish and et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, as I read the book, I found out you were the first author on that. Yeah, I I, um, I I remember when I read the paper, and then I went a lot the, the original Daryl Bem paper, which was published yeah. in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, which is a like a, a good journal where you would you would want to publish. Normally, it would be quite good to have that on your CV. Um, and uh, I went. I think having read it, I went to um, the um, Edinburgh Skeptics in the Pub, which used to be. Uh, uh, oh, well, I think it still exists, but it, we used to go each week, and there would be a talk, and and, and so on. And Richard Wiseman was there, um, and he's another one of the, the. Eventually, was the authors on that paper, and I said, "Have you seen this new study where they claim that that social um, that the para the parapsychological phenomenon are are, are, are true?" Um, and of course, it wasn't the first one by any means. I mean, there'd been there'd been very many parapsychology papers published in mainstream journals but this was the kind of the most recent one and he said yeah do you want to replicate it and so and then we got in touch with chris french and we said do you, let's do this in three different places let's record uh, let's uh, let's replicate the, the 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 exact same final experiment from the from the ben paper which was the one with the biggest effect size we thought we would do that one because we thought if it's got the biggest effect size then maybe there's more chance we can find it and and, and so on even though you know we had we had more participants, so we had a higher statistical power in our study than uh, than than he would have had. So we should have been able to replicate it, you would think. Uh, and so I did fifty participants in Edinburgh. Chris did fifty participants at Goldsmiths, and um, Richard did fifty participants at Hertfordshire. And um, we put them all together, and we found absolutely nothing. So there's no psychic effect in our in our uh, study. Specifically, the experiment was one where you had. Um, you had people uh, looking at a list of words that appeared on the screen and then th th just one at a time. And then they did a test. So some kind of test where you, you uh, it's just a memory test where you just have to write down as many words as you can recall from the list. And then the computer showed half of the words again. It randomly selected half the words and showed them again. And then that was it. And what Bem had claimed in his paper was that the words that the participants were about to see again so the words that like they they didn't know that the computer was going to show them those words again, but the words that they were about to see again were remembered better on the task than the ones that they were never going to see again. So so it's like I always say it's like you study for an exam and then you sit the exam and then you kind of go home and study again afterwards. You open up your textbook again and study again after you've done the exam. And somehow that post exam studying goes back in time to help you get a better grade on the exam um I, 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 which is kind of mind blowing but it, but the idea is that we all have these like low level psychic abilities where we can kind of sense what's going to happen in the future and it's not as if we can like make a clear prediction or like uh uh contact you know contact uh, uh the dead or any other things that psychics claim but it's just like a low level psychic ability that we all have anyway that's what he claimed in the paper and but we didn't find anything we found that the words were just as 
they were randomly remembered in the way that you would expect if there was no such thing as psychic powers. But and and that's all fun, and there's a whole discussion to be had about parapsychology and whether that's worth pursuing and 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 so on. And I think that's an interesting that's an interesting question. Like, do you pursue something that you think is a silly question? Even like if those experiments had shown had been replicable and had shown clear results, right? There's no other explanation really other than that something psychic is going on. There's no there's no way that the experiment could have leaked or anything. I mean, it's all very very straightforward. It's just like if people could if people could remember the words that they were about to see, or pre-member the words they're about to see. I don't know what word you want to use to describe remembering something <laughs> that's in the future. Yeah. Um, uh, then there isn't really another explanation. Like it's so straightforward that it has to kind of be evidence for psychic powers. Now, some people would say psych- psychic powers are so unlikely that there must be something going on. There must be some weird computer glitch or something. But I think that experiment is so straightforward that that we would all have to just put our hands up and say, like, we can't explain this using normal means. So that's a whole other question. But what we found was when we submitted the replication study to the same journal that published Daryl Bem's p- 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 original paper, they told us that not only was the paper rejected but that they wouldn't even consider it because replication studies will just never be published by this journal this journal just does never considers replication studies whether they're positive negative anywhere in between they're just not interested what they want is something new every time and to me this illustrated a big problem with with science the wanting something new every time and i think the wanting something new every time really is one of the fundamental problems that we have with the way that the structure of science, the structure of academia and so on is right now. And um, across across loads of different fields, not just, not by any means, parapsychology or psychology in general. Um, but that, that you know, my, that early experience in my PhD, um, I guess the word you would use is it radicalized me uh, somewhat about the, uh, the, the, the structure of the scientific incentive system. Yeah, so that was early on in your PhD. Uh, it would have been, yeah, probably like mid, like mid PhD or something, like second year of a three year PhD. I mean, I guess like what I find interesting is how these perspectives on replicability, reproducibility, open science, I feel like change depending on when you had your education. Um, I mean, I, I, I've, I think I've said this before, um, that on the podcast that I applied for more PhD positions than I wanted to before I got this one. And I always asked about, you know, how they felt about like open science and that kind of stuff, because it was something that was important to me. And this might be a coincidence, but I felt that there was a kind of, if people were roughly mid forties or older, you'd get something like, well, it's important to just, you know, whatever. And if they were younger than that, they'd say something like, yeah, we, I do that. We do that in this lab. It's important to me. Yeah, um, I think it's when you made your career, right? It's when you, uh, it's the stuff you're used yeah, to. Yeah. People people uh, get very attached to their way of doing things and they don't want to change them. And that, that's the case across all different contexts, not just not just science, but in every in every area, people get used to the way they do, the way they generally do stuff. And um, uh, a lot of open science ideas are, asking people to spend a lot more time uh, setting up their experiments, like pre-registering yeah. them. Or uh, and once they've got the data, they've got to put it all online and, and, and make, it, make it readable and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot more effort in, 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 in some, in some uh, uh, ways of doing open science, at least. And, um, uh, and so you're telling people to kind of upend the, the stuff that they've done that's very successfully got them into a, a, exactly. a, a position in, in, in a university, maybe got them a professorship or something. And, you know, why would anyone want to do that? The answer actually is that because it makes the science better. But unfortunately, that's one of the arguments I make is that lots of the things scientists do, you would think would be aimed at making the science better, but in fact, are aimed at things like making their CV look better uh, or or, or making making themselves more famous or notorious or well-known in their field or respected or whatever, rather than doing robust, rigorous, high-quality research. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I should always add to that one that, of course, there are people older than mid forties who do very good open science. That's right. Really of course, there are. Of course, there are. But in general, uh, I think that's. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that. I think it's kind of selecting, right? You're, you're kind of. I mean, the people who are older than that, they've they've been selected because they were good, often using an old system. Whereas, I guess, as you you know, as you said, if there if there is an incentive system for rewarding open science and these things, then yeah. the people who did that would have published less and. Totally. Or, or they would have had to adapt and, you know, maybe they've got it in them to adapt. It's just that they never, yeah, they never had that. the system yeah. that pushed them in that direction. Yeah. 
Okay, so I mean, this is so about the book. I have a very, very broad question, which is uh, especially talking about you know how how the incentive is to write as many publications as you can, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. So why did you take the time to write this book? Because that <laughs> must have been something that you know that must have been come at the cost of let's say at least a few papers. It's right? a good question. Yeah, it it, um, it certainly did slow me down dr- dramatically, and and, uh, and and doing lots of the kind of subsequent stuff about it you know the publicity and so on slowed me down massively when the book came out um i think i think in 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 you know writing it and then coming up to doing to 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 writing this book i had kind of just and and i'd done pretty well in terms of publishing stuff like i've you know i've I've, I've published lots of papers and uh, my h index is Looking good and all that sort of thing. If you if you care about that, which now I don't really. Like I like I like I I had, I had kind of tried that. I'd seen that you can do that and you can get lots of publications and it's very good and it feels satisfying at the time. But I guess in some kind of anhedonic way, I I, I had sort of I just don't really care that much anymore about burnishing my CV or H index and 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 and, and um, I know that's not very like useful advice for other for other people. But um, I certainly got to the point where I just like was like okay, I've kind of done this now and I can see that this is possible. Um, and I can see all the ways that it's, that, that it, that it distorts science and makes science less good as well. Is it, you know, this big rush to have loads and loads of papers on every possible topic and, 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 and in every possible journal and in, well, as long as it's got a high impact factor and all that. So yeah, I think yeah. I had, I think I had, um, I had just given given up in some way, uh, uh, and and you know I still am interested in in in, in publishing stuff, but I, but I, I'm happy to go much slower now to publish stuff that's really good and really and really thoughtful and high quality, hopefully, and making a decent you know large scale contribution rather than you know just jumping at any opportunity to to to, to publish stuff. Okay, is it is it because you'd already kind of. As you said, your H index was looking good, so you had the the opportunity, you had the freedom to not care about it. Was that? Yeah, maybe, it, maybe. I, d- I certainly didn't feel any external pressure anymore. To uh, you know, I had um, come to the end of a postdoc and stuff, but um, I, I think I'm, uh, uh, j- uh, you know, by by uh, in personality, just not very, um, con- I don't know, conformist or something. I would say, or, or something like that. Like I, I, I always once I've got into a situation, I think, well, I, you know, I now need to sort of. Um, I have quite a contrarian way of, of 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 dealing with things, and 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 I think once I once I had you know got this got my current job and so on, I thought, is this does this make sense the way we do stuff? Is this is this right? And that's what kind of came into the book was was questioning a lot of a lot of a lot of the way that currently science is done and the incentives and and the the implicit and explicit pushes that we get from our employers to publish more stuff, get more money, constantly be asking you know begging begging people for 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 money and for grants and 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 so on. And it's not good. It's not good, and um, it really does uh, shake your confidence in the whole process of of doing of doing scientific research. Once you dig into, you know, the meta science and some of the stuff I talk about in the in, in the book, um, and it almost can be paralyzing in some sense. You can almost be sort of like, you know, I, I don't want to do anything. You know, if I'm at risk of making a mistake or or I'm at risk of you know producing biased research in some way, maybe you don't want to do anything. And I think that's a kind of a bad reaction to to to, to this because there are things you can there are things you can do. But I I have felt that on a few occasions, that sort of almost like panicky kind of like, oh my God, is this going to be any you know, is this is this contributing to the problems or or or, or actually doing something about them? Right. I mean how apart from writing a book about it uh... I don't know exactly raise a word. like I don't know exactly what your goal was per se with writing the book, but other than that, like what do you do as a like, individual researcher? Yeah, well, um, uh, the goal of writing the book was to have the conversation. And I think I think a huge part of this this replication crisis thing is just getting the word out there. I meet people who have never heard of a lot of these who are scientists who have never heard of a lot of these controversies. Um, you tell them about a very well known case of scientific fraud. You think it's well known, but actually, actually, it's not at all. Because it's known by the people in the bubble of people who are interested yeah, yeah. in scientific fraud and the replication crisis and so on, but not necessarily by you know your average uh, scientist who's who works in a lab or whatever. So you meet them and tell, tell them about it, and they're amazed and so on. And I thought, well, that's a good opportunity. And then actually, I think the general public should know about this stuff as well, given that it's in most, well, in many many cases, their money being used to to do a lot of this research, um, and they need to demand 
higher standards of scientists. I think they have a they have a picture which has been cultivated by scientists themselves of this kind of objective truth seeking process that uh, you know the peer review uh, process deals with issues of any 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 mistakes or errors and so on. And you get these these things which go out into a culture called peer review papers, and you can you know uh, you can refer to peer reviewed papers say in your in news articles and so on, and that means. In some sense, that what you're saying is true, and it buttresses all your claims, and so on. I think people need to know that that whole system is is really leaky and has loads of issues of of uh, of um, uh, the, well, the, you know, the things I talk about: bias, negligence, uh, 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 fraud, hype in 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 the book, um, and that the image we have of this pristine process of science is actually in many ways is actually in many ways uh, uh, distorted by these by these problems, which I think not enough people know, know about. And then you know, you have something like that came just after I finished writing the book, the, the COVID pandemic, that really does show that science can be can be uh, uh, um, very badly distorted by all sorts of different pressures operating on it from from within science, from outside, from politics, from society, and so on. Um, uh, and that's not to say that the the main principles of doing science are bad. I'm, I'm a, I think science is the best thing that we've ever invented as a human species. But it's but 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 the 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 kind of situation that we do it in academia, even industry, whatever, is kind of suffused with problems that push it in the wrong direction. And so and so yes, to answer your question, the po- the, the 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 point of writing the book was to get that word out there to some extent. As an individual researcher, uh, I like to think that I'm you know encouraging people in our department to do more open science stuff. Um, we've got an open science club, which I didn't found, but you know I've been supportive of it over the years. We've got an open science kind of journal club thing in our department. Uh, I've been trying to push training for PhD students. So instead of just like the self-selecting thing where there's an open science club and all the people who are interested in open yeah, science yeah. go to that and everybody else just goes on with their normal day, um, you want to try and get supervisors of PhD students trained in these kind of techniques like pre-registration and open data and all the other things that we that we would you know consider to be open science. And the PhD students themselves trained in in those issues as well. So so starting off at the earliest day, earliest career stages and kind of pushing towards you know um, kind of getting people educated in the stuff that will really make a difference, hopefully. And 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 instead of I think there's a huge problem at the moment of, and this is the problem I had with you know for instance there was a a thing a few years ago about um, reviewers. Uh, saying, I will not review this paper unless the data are open. And it's a very well-meaning thing. But my worry is that if everyone who's interested in open science signs up to that, then you'll just get a set of people who are less interested in open science, maybe the less good people, the people who are like less interested in rigor and, and replicability and so on, reviewing the papers that don't have the the, <laughs> the, the open data. So you'll have this weird selection process where yeah, there's a set yeah. of papers that are done by the open science people and there's a set of papers that are, you know, and reviewed by them uh, and a set of papers that are done and reviewed by non-open science people. And that doesn't sound like a, a good kind of structural change to the, to the, 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 the system that we have. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's a tricky one. I mean, is a good approach to just kind of not nudge in the in the in the you know behavior economics way, but in a more colloquial sense, to to push people by like asking for smaller things. I mean, I remember um, I once helped my super uh, one of my supervisors with the peer review, and um, we uh, you know the, the the figures they had were or at least some of them were bar plots, and just with another, I mean, standard error of the mean or whatever, but it was just bar plots. And, but it was the kind of study where they could have very easily just added individual data points, like, you know, just to show what the mean is made of and that kind of thing. And so we said, like, you know, you know, this is really the kind of study that could, where well, you could do this very easily. Yeah. It's not, you know, if you have thousands of people, it doesn't really make necessary sense. Uh, but with that, it was very possible. And then, you know, they added it. And then, like, sometime later, we saw a talk by one of the researchers. And, you know, I think all of the plots had, individual data points and then um, not i think not only from that study but also from later ones nice so you so, had induced the change in their general yeah i mean sort of i'm not sure how convinced the person was per se about it um but, but they realized least, it was a thing you have to do to please reviewers yeah yeah it seemed a bit more like that than anything else but but yeah you're right i think getting people to do small things like that um is be- has to be better than nothing right and and this is what i often say to people who are worried by the whole like edifice of open science and there's all this stuff that there's all this stuff that yeah. they ha- they should apparently be doing and, 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 and so on 
maybe you don't, you know, maybe you don't need to do it all. Um, you know, just pre-registering your your paper is better than is better than doing nothing. Um, oh, just dropped a just dropped a pen. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, just just doing just doing uh, pre-registration is better than doing nothing. Just putting your code online is better than doing nothing. You know, uh, um, you, you don't need to put all your data online. There's 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 ways you can share stuff. You can embargo things. There's all sorts of different options, and I think getting people on board with open science will involve convincing them that they don't need to, you know, completely, they don't need to, it's not this horrible, you know, grueling process necessarily. It does add extra time, but it can be made easier. And I think that's one of the big things that the Center for Open Science are doing. They're making their website and so on um, full of tools that help people do what they want to do in an, you know, as easily as, as, as possible. Um one of the big problems for implementing any kind of change is that there's all this inertia, right? And you want people to just easily be able to, 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 to make the change you want. And at the moment, we, we, we don't encourage people to, you know, to, to, to do these things. And we, and they don't know, like people will come up to me and say, how do you pre-register something? I've never, I've never encountered this before. I, 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 it sounds really difficult. And you can tell them, well, you just, you can just make a word document and, 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 and post it online if yeah, you want. Exactly. It can be minimal. It can be, a pre-registration can be as minimal as you want. It can be it can be a one sentence, you know, uh, uh, plan. I mean, that's not very useful. The better pre-registrations will be the ones that are as detailed as possible, yeah, of yeah. course. But like the best pre-registration will be one where you simulate all the data beforehand. You have all the code written out, and 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 so you've got everything ready, and so you just collect the real data, plug it into the code, and press go. Hardly anyone is going to be able to is going to be able to have all that planned out in advance before they touch any of the data. Um, but you can do just short of that. You can do somewhere on the spectrum between writing one sentence and writing a huge, big, huge, big thing. So just uh, encouraging people to realize that just making small changes in what they do, they don't need to be completely extreme. They don't need to be massively revolutionary, can improve the quality of their science and certainly make the whole thing more transparent for someone who comes along and tries to work out what is wrong with their paper if they find an error or, or just wants to do the same thing again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's like one big thing there is that it's not a... You have to be 100% perfect and not do it at all. Hmm. Um, but there are right. these gradations in the middle. I mean, that's why, for example, but yeah, that's one thing that I think that isn't well known, for example, that on, if you use the, uh, I keep forgetting whether it's the OSF or the COS. Um, the I, Open I Science know. Framework is the website, but it's run by the Center for Open Science. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so on the OSF, then the, um, you know, the pre-registration forms that you can you know, you, you don't have to do the, the really long one. You yeah, can do you the as predicted you one. You can if you want, but you um, don't have to. Yeah. And also, I think, like, one thing that I'm also realizing now is that not not all of your studies have to be 100% of what you can do. I mean, for example, like, I try to do all of those things. And that's, you mm. know, I also spent a lot of time in my first year of my PhD learning those that stuff. You know, so we have this one study that's, for example, with uh, prisoners, and it's about psychopathy. So we have psychopathy scores from a specific prison. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, some of those are fairly high. Right. And so if we were to, you know, release the, yeah. uh, the entire data set, then you would have like age, psychopathy score, whatever from a specific prison. So probably be pretty easy to figure out. Well, you would have to, you would have to do some kind of anonymization. Search the news. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So there's, yeah, I mean, some of those you can find in the news, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> some okay. of those crimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can literally find the name of the person. Um, yeah, that, that, but, yeah. And, and, and there are, there are other situations where you wouldn't want to make the data public, like, yeah. You've you've created a new strain of uh, the coronavirus right. that infects people vastly more than the current one does. Like you, you, you can imagine the sort of situation. You don't want to make that DNA sequence public. Um, uh, and there was a situation a few years ago with with uh, with bird flu where where people did this, and there was a big controversy about what they had put online. And I think they had to amend what they had put online because they were worried that you know a, a terrorist or some kind of state actor. That would would come along and, and and use the data in 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 the wrong way. So so yeah, from everything from like identifying participants all the way to you know <laughs> encouraging terrorists to <laughs> produce bioweapons, there are some reasons. But I think the vast majority of cases where you've just run an experiment on some undergrads in your psychology department, say in in, in the world of psychology, or you've or you've run some kind of experiment in in any other in another topic that's not overtly dangerous or political in some way. Um, I think most people could could do a hell of a lot more about making their data available. Yeah, and also even if I mean, so the the kind of question that I have is that I I know there is this idea of synthetic data sets, right? Um, that Dan Quintana's written about. Mm-hmm. He's written this prime in eLife, 
And oh, by the way, for those who don't know, I put the references of any paper we mentioned in the description, mm. so you don't have to search for it. Uh, so I'll put that in there too. Um, you know, that's, for example, a way that would be, I'm considering doing, but the, for example, there's the case where I'll probably say like, I, it seems like the main package or software tool is an R. I'm not very familiar with R. I, I'm not sure I'm going to learn that one for this particular thing that is really worth it. So sure. I think, but, but if you were really, de- if you were, if you were really desperate to do it, the, 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 the um, yeah, the tool is out there. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the point also being just that, I mean, the tool is there, but you don't have to use do everything all the time. Just right. Just absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, Michelle Knighton has made this point before. She said that, you know, you can, you, you can just do, you can get people into open science by, by saying you can do some things. It's like a pick and mix. You can do some aspects of it and they all will make your research better in some respects, even if it's not, you know, the flagship, most open, transparent paper ever. Yeah, and there's also uh, maybe last point on the on this or the previous illustrations. There's also I think this uh, commentary. I don't know whether it's Brian Nozick or who exactly wrote this uh, with some co-authors. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called something like pre-registration is a skill or something like that. You have to learn. Okay, right, totally. Which and is you know like the first one I wrote wasn't as good as the second one yeah, I wrote. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, know. you learn. Oh, okay. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, uh, um, you know, say this particular thing, or I should be more clear about this. This is something which is going to come up, you know, when we get to look at the data and I really should prepare for that. Yeah, no, no, completely. It's all, it's all that way. And we do feel like everything has to be completely perfect each time. As long as you're transparent about what you've done and you said, you know, we've, you know, this is how we wrote things up and this is the stuff that we pre-registered and this is the stuff that we didn't and and so on. As long as you do that, then um, that's, the principle of the thing is to be transparent. Uh, and the principle of all of these things is to make the research more, more transparent. Okay, so here's a here's a question now that just came that I just thought of. That's I mean, this is I think a fairly common mm. uh, problem. But sure. So basically, what we're doing right now is we're making it harder. So let's think of the case of like scientific fraud, right? So if we set up all these um, open science things, we're now basically just putting more work for people who wouldn't who don't commit fraud. Right. Mm-hmm. In, in some sense, like it, it feels like, you know, if you're the kind of person who really worries about getting all of this stuff right and tries to get open code, open data, pre- etc. It's going to take you a lot gonna, longer. It's going to be a lot of effort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, and you're not going to commit. You're not the person who's probably going to commit fraud, I would imagine. Unless it becomes so much the norm that everyone has to. Uh, yeah, I but, mean, there have been some cases where people have put their data online and it's been fraudulent. I mean, that, that, right, that has, right, that has yeah, it's rare, yeah. I think. And I think. It does take quite a certain type of person to put on a put a fraudulent data set up online because you know you gotta you gotta think that no one will ever look at it or, or you know be so arrogant to think that no one will ever notice the stuff that you've that you've done. But yeah, I think that has been done before. But yeah, cl- clearly it's going to be an incentive against it. Yeah, but it, my, my point is more that we're, we're making it harder for honest scientists right now to do their job. Or is but this maybe just being like honest a brief is brief phase. Be, be, then, being honest is being uh, is is you know putting in some more hard work, making things making things open and transparent isn't isn't easy or straightforward and uh but i don't think science i don't think anyone ever advertised science as being open as being easy and straightforward to to, to, to do right yeah, that's fair enough. the people who are doing easy and straightforward research um are often the people whose research doesn't end up replicating you had a lot of very very straightforward uh social psychology priming studies in the early 2000s for instance you know you had tons of really straightforward stuff there where you would just come up with some verbal metaphor and then you would you would test it and it's a lot of nonsense of course like like uh, uh they, they would test this this metaphor uh, uh about you know my favorite example being the the experiment which was published in psychological science i think in like 2000 and actually actually i'm not gonna i'm not even gonna attempt the the the, the uh uh the date because i'm not 100 percent sure but like i'll put maybe, it in yeah you can find it. Yeah. the idea is thinking outside the box is a metaphor right so they got people to come into a room and there's a cardboard box in the middle of the room and they do a creativity test either sitting in the cardboard box or outside the cardboard box and (laughs) um and if they're if if they're inside the box they have lower creativity scores than people who are sitting outside the box and now that sounds like the sort of thing that people came up with in the pub or something they just like came up with a silly idea they tested it and so on people who are doing and by the way, the effect size is just gigantic, and there's absolutely no way that it's that, it's, that it can. I mean, maybe it's because be you're in a cramped box. Well, I mean, the, the, yeah, it's probably not because of the metaphor. Yeah, but the idea is that the idea is that um, that I was trying to get across is that like straightforward, fun stuff like that 
it's probably crap you know like the good the good the good research takes a long time takes theoretical uh, uh input takes takes you know um a lot of twists and turns before you touch any of the data uh, and that's actually you know one of the one of the great things about doing um doing research this new way with pre-registration and you know we've got a registered report in with my phd student uh, uh right now and I was saying to her, you know, this is this is obviously how science should be done. We're having a conversation now with the reviewers on our plan. They, they like the general idea, but they've added some new, you know, twists to it and so on. This is obviously how you should do research because you're sending in you send in your full paper, and all the reviewers can do is kind of give you some post hoc suggestions that maybe you should have done this, maybe you should have done that. But that's you know that's all after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, doing it this way is clearly the best way to do things. It's harder. It takes a longer time, probably, because you can't just do your silly box experiment and send it in. Um, but it's you know it, it really feels like you're you're doing you're doing proper science. Where uh, it, it, now I don't really want to go back to the, the the standard way of publishing. Yeah, definitely. Um, how is uh, just a curiosity? Like I'm, I haven't written a register report yet. I've I've helped review one or two. Mm. Um, I think in. The one I can remember right now, I think we massively improved the paper. It would have been right, right, totally. a complete waste of time before because they had so many problems with it. Right, right. And, um, but it doesn't mean you. It doesn't mean it can be chucked out. It means it means it's uh, you know it, it's possibly savable before they before they do the paper before they actually collect any the data. Yeah, yeah. If they hadn't had your input, they would have published a really rubbish paper uh, somewhere, or they would have they would have not necessarily published it, but they would have written it up, done the experiment, sent it off somewhere, and it would have been crap. So yeah, totally. So I think that's, but um, so I haven't, so I have, I have that perspective, but not the perspective of, you know, being the author. Just, I'm just curious, like, what's, how's that been for you? I don't know. That's a very vague question, but I'm not entirely sure. What. In, extremely positive. No, extremely positive so so far for this for this one that we're working on right now. We've we've in in many ways just felt really grateful that like we did this because oh I'm so I'm so glad that this was pointed out because we didn't think of that particular thing that they've that they've done we didn't we didn't think of this issue um not that it would have necessarily been a mistake but you could totally imagine making a mistake and then someone points it out in, in the registered report process um not yeah not just that it was a mistake but just like th- they had some better ideas they had some things to add on that made the paper much better and we feel super grateful to them and you know how you always write in reviews like we're really grateful for the reviewer's suggestion blah, blah, blah. you always write that every time but we genuinely <laughs> yeah, yeah. are this in, in in this case and um, we're not just we're not just saying that to, to kind of placate the reviewers we genuinely are, are, are really impressed at how you know how many good things they've added to the to the, to the paper and and as i say obviously this is how you should be doing science but from a practical perspective like how much so, you know, for example, I'm now, uh, I've got like one and a half years left in my PhD, basically. Mm. Um, for example, I wonder whether it's almost too late for my PhD for me to, you know, submit this, get feedback. You know, maybe, I don't know, but just trying to get at the question, the problem of kind of time. So yeah. how long has the this problem taken is so that you can't, you? yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem, isn't it? Because like basically the way that PhDs are set out with the ticking, the ticking clock yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. the start means that you can't really do research this way or, or, or in many cases you won't. Well, be I could have, I could have done way. earlier, but you could have started off seems, this way. Yeah. 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 But, I, but it's, it's clearly not what they were thinking about when they set up the whole yeah, idea yeah. of doing a PhD in three years and all sorts. Like it's clearly not what, um uh was yeah. was was in people's minds um yeah i think you either start off this way or or do the other stuff that's or do the other stuff that's 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 short of doing a registered report like you know doing full pre-registrations and so on um but not necessarily doing the full doing the full thing uh and people should recognize that that's better than not having done those things and just writing up your paper and not pre-registering it and so on it's just that the registered report provides an extra level of like belt and braces um uh, security on the robustness of the results and just in general the quality of the paper i think and so it is it is unfortunate to have missed it and i'm thinking back to loads of stuff i've done in the past where i was like i wish i had <laughs> you know run this past reviewers before i before yeah. i did the experiment because i'm sure they would have picked out a couple of things which only occurred to me after i'd done the analysis and after you've done the analysis it's like the old the, the the Ronald Fisher thing about you know you show your experiment to the statistician after you've done it and he he can't necessarily tell you how to improve it but he can tell you what it died of like that's the yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. the the classic the classic quote and and it's so true and and that insight that insight is is what really fundamentally is kind of at the bottom of the the register report idea which is after after the fact it's way too late yeah yeah um, one question about educational resources uh so one thing that i still find is that i maybe this exists but i'm not aware of it but 
there isn't there should be like one good open science book or something that people can just read um i mean i for example had to like you know read lots of different papers and you know this kind of messy search through how to do this stuff and that kind of stuff and is there any like one good resource that kind of just guides you through and says like this is pre-registration this is this this is this is this and kind of yeah guides you to yeah, yeah kind I mean, of a there, good starting point in a way there as well. are um there are open science reading lists some of them are probably a bit out of date by, by now I'm trying to think of like the 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 best one. I can't really off the top of my head. I can I can send you some uh, potential examples. But yeah, there are reading lists that have been created by like people who have gone to you know people who have been part of uh, uh, organizations like the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, for instance, uh, the SIPS um, group, uh, who have kind of collated together stuff. But I think a good place to start is to look on the Open Science, the Center for Open Science site, and if you if you just put in Open Science reading list, you'll find. You'll find a whole a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff, but I think um, I tried to include a lot of the stuff in my book as well of uh, ideas, of course. But but my book is aimed it's at the general public rather than right. yeah, it's not like a it's not like a here is how you should be doing it um, type textbook thing. Or, I think I think like your book is really good to have an awareness of what some of the problems are, mm. but then if you actually want to do science. I think you need an additional thing. Yeah, yeah no, no, totally, totally, yeah. you, you totally do. Um, but yeah, there are some there are some reading lists out there, and there are reading lists for some of the other specific issues that you get in some fields like for instance there's one about yeah, measurement in psychology like there's a measurement reading list and, uh, and and so on that you can kind of um you can kind of dig in on one specific topic and the kind of new thinking that's related to the open science movement but it's not necessarily the core the core stuff that applies that applies just kind of universally to science okay cool so i guess we'll put one or two in the description yeah yeah i can send you yeah just can top of my head, search can for the specific it. thing yeah that they're interested in okay cool uh, maybe one slight random question. I'm not sure I've seen a book or a website for a book where the author says, "I'll pay you if you find my errors in my manuscript." How can you can you briefly talk about what that is and how that how that came about? Yeah, well, and how, an and idea... how much this has cost you so far? Well, <laughs> yeah, thankfully not too much. So after I wrote the hardback version of the book, or, or you know, I wrote the wrote the manuscript, which then was released in hardback, I realized that I would have a chance to do. Corrections, right? You have when the book is reprinted as a uh, uh, as a paperback, for instance, you can get you can do corrections. There are also different editions and so on. But you know, it's not a it's not over once the book is is published in its first obviously its first edition. That would be that would be silly. So you do have the opportunity to make some changes. And so I thought since I spend lots of the book, the vast majority of the book, criticizing other scientists, it's only fair if other people can criticize me. And obviously, there are going to be lots of areas of subjective disagreement where it's actually just like a you know we, we disagree on this and we can have a debate about it and it's about in- interpretation and so on but there are still there are going to be some things that are just wrong just objectively untrue that i've that i've said because i've it was, it was an oversight i didn't pay attention i looked at the wrong number i made a typo whatever it is uh and um this is inspired by the idea of the the bug bounty in computer science where you um pay people for finding bugs in your in your in your code um there are various other people who have done this for their scientific papers i don't think i've seen anyone do it for a like a popular book before yeah, I haven't um, seen it, yeah. and i got the i got the i got the idea that you know people can go on the website and send me a comment and say like on page you know uh, 154 you got this wrong and people have and uh, several people have I split it into major errors for which I pay fifty pounds and minor errors for which I pay five pounds. Minor errors, there's been quite a few people have picked up things like me saying that a journalist writes for one newspaper when in fact they write for another one, uh, or um, getting a date wrong or or something like that. But there has also been, I think, there's one major error which is where I, I just made a complete error of fact when I said that a study had not been done and in fact it had. Um, I was just wrong about that. I just didn't know. Um, it was just a screw up on my part, and so I'm happy to pay. And I give people to, I give people the option to take the money themselves or to give it to a charity of their choice or if they can't choose one then i'll just give it to the one of the malaria charities um uh and i think no one has kept the money so far i think they've all given it to charity um <laughs> that was gonna be a, uh, another question like well it's like a pressure thing now you see everyone else is giving yeah, you charity. Also, you also like, put the oh, name right you I put like this person yeah i put their name as well yeah, the yeah, money yeah, is yeah, given yeah. to this foundation yes exactly uh so they've so, so there's been there's been quite a few including a very embarrassing one in the first line where i got the the uh there's, there's a questionable interpretation of the date that i put in the first line of the book um <laughs> uh, which i consider to be a minor error but um still it's majorly embarrassing because it's in the f- first yeah, line yeah. Of the, 
Yeah. But it shouldn't be embarrassing, right? The point of this is that... Yeah, of course, yeah. The point of this is that everyone clearly makes mistakes. I read a lot of books and I review a lot of books for you know various newspapers and stuff through through each year and I find errors in every single one um not just disagreements but objective errors where I think that's just that's just a, that's yeah. just they've put the wrong name down there or they've said the wrong thing I just happen to know that that's that, that's objectively wrong and normally you've no recourse right normally you've no recourse to do that sometimes you do a book review where someone says this book is full of errors and that's kind of part of the book review but it's not a kind of formal thing that you that you have set up where you can contact the author and say I think you got the you know something wrong on, on that particular page um and so I, um, i'm hoping that this will catch on and more people will will will, will do this when uh, when their books come out and they'll, and they'll just say look hands up i got i got this completely wrong and uh, we need to correct it yeah i'm always surprised um so I'm, i mean i'm also interested in writing and then i've been thinking about publication business and that kind of thing and what really surprised me was thinking about was is that there isn't some easy way that people, you know, that you somehow like. So basically, I think what you have is people have to write an email. Is that correct? And say like on page. It's on. It's on this. the contact. There's a contact form on the on the website where they can they can send yeah, yeah. A, send. But a, it's basically a email, right? Where they yeah. tell you like where. Yeah, it goes to my email. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm always surprised that there isn't that that you know not a major publisher as far as I know has put something up where people can just like oh I guess you have to then then you could just read the book for free, but uh, where you could where you see the book as an mm. ebook and you can just click through. Uh, or search for certain words and then just comment on it and say, yeah, like, this is wrong. Yeah. You know, I'm always surprised that that hasn't happened. Because yeah, especially- but I think there's there's reasons. I mean, first of all, publishers don't... I mean, I did this off my own back. I mean, the, the, I, the publishers were were pleased for me to do it. The, I, you know, I talked to them about it first and they thought it was a good idea. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not really... They're not incentivized to do this because it's not, it doesn't really look great for publishers to say, here's all our... Uh, here's Our books are riddled with errors, by the way, and we want you to correct them. Like, I can see how that would look bad. If you didn't have this mindset of everyone makes mistakes and we want to correct them, yeah, yeah. But not just that. I think just you know this could be misused in some cases, or, or there would be certain books that would be kind of really focused on for this kind of thing, and you can see how it would become like almost like one of those ed- Wikipedia editing wars where you know there's a certain yeah, controversial yeah, yeah. book comes out and everyone comments on it yeah, and exactly. nobody knows which are the comments that they should take seriously and and, and so on. So you can imagine and the publishers just. Really and the publishers, comments, why yeah. would they want to spend their resources on like mod- moderating that kind of that kind of thing? So um, I kind of feel like um, you know, some of the books on culture war topics would would go, you know, the number of comments yeah, would be yeah. through the roof. Yeah, but yeah, I guess I guess your your book is is the kind of in terms of content and topic unique and lends itself to this kind of thing for being like a cool additional thing. Rather yeah, than, yeah, it, it, it fits with the general ethos of the book, which is we want to correct things and make things right. And in fact, now I've done it, it would be ironic not to have done something like that, to, to be really, really clear about the errors and, and, and be open about them and, and have this whole thing I talk about in the book about organized skepticism and all this sort of thing. Um, whereas for some books, it might be less relevant or or, or, or the authors just simply want to, move on to the next thing rather than focusing on the research. Yeah, I mean, also in some cases, it just doesn't really matter, right? Like, you know, like, for example, I mean, let's be honest, like, I think one of the errors I saw it was that you apparently early on said that Cass Sunstein had won the Nobel Prize rather than Richard Thaler. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, who cares? Well, <laughs> like, sure. it, it's I mean, mistake. they might, but it's, <clears throat> I'm sure it's not going to change the story. Anything yeah, the they, book, they right? so yeah, they wrote a book together and then one of them won a Nobel Prize. Um, yeah. Whereas uh, I said that the other one had won a Nobel Prize and... Uh, yeah, I, I just, uh, it was just a kind of oversight, one of those moments where you just write the wrong name down, you're not paying full attention. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you're right. And, and, um, there are some things which are so minor that I'll not pay out. Like if someone finds like a, like a, 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 a non consequential typo, then I'll just correct it and not. But I think things should be corrected. I think the general attitude, I'm trying to push this general attitude of when you make a mistake, you should correct it rather yeah. than, like I've seen authors who have had objective errors pointed out in their book just in the last few weeks. I won't name names, but I've seen, you know, there's a, there's an author right now who's got a controversial book out right now where there are errors, there are objective errors in it. And she is kind of on Twitter saying, is this all you can find in my book? And sure, it's a minor, it's a minor issue. But, you know, when you make a mistake, you should say, uh, sorry about that. I made, I made a mistake and I'll, I'll correct it rather than... Yeah. Yeah, try harder next time. You're desperate to find mistakes in my book. And there may well be. Like, but it doesn't matter if if people hate your guts and that's why they're discovering errors in your book. If they are real errors and they're genuinely objective errors of fact that you've put in your book, 
it doesn't matter if the person pointing them out hates you and uh, you know you should correct you should correct those errors because what matters is getting things right um, and it fit I mean it it fits in this whole general attitude of science right of this general attitude of science as being like do we care about what's true or do we care about finding new exciting things and moving on to the next thing and all that it's exactly the same issue really if you boil it down as the issue with the Daryl Ben thing uh, where they wouldn't publish our replication study uh, if you don't care about what's true then you'll end up in a situation like this journal where you don't publish any replication studies ever. If you care about what's true, then you'll, you know, in this case, correct the record by having yeah. a replication study published, um, which maybe shows that the original paper you published was not um, 100% replicable. So so um, I think it's the same issue at base, which is kind of being intellectually humble enough to say, look, I know there's going to be errors, but, you know, um, uh, uh, there is a mechanism for correcting those. And then this fits into this whole thing where... I've experienced a minor amount of this in just a few things that I've done in, over the years, trying to correct errors in scientific papers. But there are people out there whose whole job is scientific integrity who are trying to correct errors in scientific papers, or or they have it as a major like side interest of theirs, is contacting editors, contacting authors, contacting universities to try and get mistakes uh, corrected in papers. Um, and what they get back is bullshit. And I mean bullshit in the Harry Frankfurt sense where, you know, there's lies, there's truth and there's lies and there's bullshit. And truth is people who care about getting things right. And liars care about the truth because they want to flip it around and convince you of something else other than the truth. But bullshitters don't care. Bullshitters don't care about the truth. And if you don't care about the truth uh, and you're editing a journal or you've written a scientific paper, um, then your scientific paper is bullshit, and by by that by that definition, you're just writing it to impress people or to make a to make some sort of political point or to uh, uh, make it look as if you're cool and smart and you've got a nice CV or whatever. It's bullshit in that case. It's not actually a, an attempt at the truth. So, um, uh, in order to stop science from turning into bullshit, we need to have some mechanism to actually say, look, we care about what's true here, and we'll correct things if they're wrong. Actually, should journals have something like this i mean so actually i mean so for context i i talked to joe hilgart oh yeah oh well yeah he's had a he's had a long experience of yeah exactly this. and we Very talked uh, largely about the zhang um yeah. affair as he calls it yeah which is you know fantastic i mean not fantastic <laughs> it's very interesting to read and very frustrating yeah um, it's fantastic in that sense uh that it's well done but um you know for example i the reason i contacted him because i found something in the paper where uh, i'm very certain that there's some like some stuff just went wrong there right it seems more like negligence than anything else okay yeah. um but i'm pretty sure that two figures can't be both correct they seem right. mutually exclusive okay. and um part of why i asked him to, to talk about this was also i wanted to hear like what he thought i should do next mm. because it's it's a it's not a super influential paper but like in a in a limited context i mean i'm being intentionally vague here because i haven't sure, sure, sure. contacted the authors or anything. yeah no no you don't want to name um, names at this point. yeah just just so you know um so uh, you know i didn't know what to do about this because it felt like i should definitely say something because mm. like this is just there's just stuff that's wrong of in course, here and yeah. it's it's one of the first papers on a certain thing and um and he basically just asked him what i should do and he basically said like yeah just ignore it you know, like he basically said, like, you know, you've got if you want to stay in science and do your career. Well, it's yeah, he has, he has left academia and it's a huge loss. Yeah, he's, he he's actually brilliant. left it like two months after we yeah. talked this up. Yeah, he's 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 brilliant. And it's a, it, 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 it is really sad to see it happen. But I can completely understand because the frustration I've only been involved in some very minor cases personally uh, trying to get things corrected. And it really is a kind of random, you know, you, you, or, or fairly arbitrary process where sometimes you'll get a correction and, and it'll be no problem. Sometimes there'll be huge resistance and yeah, you'll get a correction. Sometimes you'll get resistance and, uh, uh, and nothing will happen. Sometimes you'll get, you, you'll, you'll just hear absolutely nothing. Or in fact, in one case, we heard back from the authors very quickly and said, yeah, we're really sorry about this mistake. We'd love to correct it. We're going to correct it for you. And then they just never yeah. did. There's never nothing ever happened. It's been four That's the years. Best way to do. It's been Those four are smart years. People. Nothing happened. We contacted editors. They know how editors. to deal with stuff. Yeah, editors yeah. didn't care. Authors didn't care. There's no correction. We found objective errors in the paper. No one gives a fuck. It's been cited like a hundred yeah. times. This paper. No one cares. And 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 that in that case, you know, is 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 the opposite of how of how science uh, should should work. Obviously, like like anyone would 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 say. Now there might be some 
reasons that the people have. They're very busy or something. They, 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 they haven't been able to consider it. But if you edit the journal and, and, and or you publish the journal or whatever, there needs to be something in place where you... This is why editors can put an editorial expression of concern on an article, right? They can, they can say, we're concerned about this article. Um, maybe the authors haven't been contacted yet or haven't made a decision about what they want to do. But we just want you to know that we think there are some issues with this paper. That's why the editorial expression of concern exists as a... As a, as a thing, you know, as, as a thing that editors can do. Um, and I think they should be using it a lot more. Uh, oh, um, I didn't know this was a thing. Yeah. So you can, you can flag, you can flag as an editor, you can flag an article with an expression of concern. And in many cases, the expression of concern is basically it happens a few days or weeks before the retraction, right? It, it, it's basically saying someone's pointed out to me that there's major fraud in this article. We're doing the investigation right now, but for now, you should know that this article is under suspicion and then it gets retracted. But I think it should be much more common for editors to say, you know, we, the, the, there's some serious concerns about this about this paper. It may be the case that we remove this expression of concern in the future because the person answers the, the question and it's completely fine. Um, and there's there's some more complex issue why the data look a bit suspicious. And this happens. This happens sometimes. There's a guy on 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 Twitter I saw um, being in touch with some people uh, who did a trial of a drug for COVID. And he looked at the data. They looked at the data looked weird in, in various respects. He contacted the authors, and they completely convinced him beyond a shadow of a doubt that the, the data are actually fine. There was a particular process regarding correlated variables that made the data look a bit weird in some respects, but they're not weird really. They're completely consistent with the trial having happened. They were able to provide him with evidence that the trial happened, and 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 so on. And he was totally convinced. Actually, you know, I originally thought it was fraud, but it's not. That can happen. But there are many cases where. The data never existed in the first, like the, the, the trial never existed in the first place. The data have been made up, and editors can flag that even if they haven't been able to get the authors to agree to retract it. And of course, you don't, in the final instance, need to have the authors to agree anyway. You can you can retract a paper without the author's agreement. But so um, here's a not exactly a suggestion, then, but I'm just curious what you think of it. So one reason also why I haven't con- like done anything about this yet. I mean, there's a few reasons, but one of them is also that like I'd have to write this. You know, I have to basically, there's, there's, there's no, as far as I'm aware of real template for this, I'd have to like write this email from scratch, think about how I address mm-hmm. this, mm-hmm. how I talk to them. Um, in this case, they, I think this was done a few, but not too many years ago. Uh, so it's fairly recent still. Sure. But now the people are all, uh, uh, at prestigious universities uh. and, uh, professors, et cetera. Right. I, 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 so right. And as an early career researcher, careful. as an early career researcher, you don't want to. Be putting yourself but into the situation where you're I like... I wonder... So here's a kind of... I'm well, wondering like what you think of that. So basically something like you have on your website, but a bit more systematized and automatic, where people can just do that about papers. Mm-hmm. Like why have... I mean, I guess because it's work, that's why they haven't done it. But would that <laughs> yeah. make sense? Or is that just... Well, there are already there are already a few mechanisms like that. So there's there's the website, there's PubPeer, uh, which is an anonymous website where you can post comments on any paper you want uh, that are... Yeah, but I mean something more like... So, right, so right, um, just to maybe specify it a bit more. Mm. I don't want to... Um, uh, it seems like there were honest mistakes and they can probably be fixed or... Well, I don't think they could, they do it, but um, I'd like something where I could just automatically kind of, ideally, like I'd, I'd have something where you have the, the website with the paper and then you could click something like comment something on this anonymously and then I could just say like, hey, this and this and this is the case with this paper that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and then I'd yeah. be done, you know, then I'd be done in like five minutes. I mean, some than... some journals do allow comment sections on their on their paper, like some of the nature journals have a little comment section under under each paper that you can do that. But the problem is, again, uh, it gets abused in some cases, like papers that have perhaps politically inconvenient results or controversial results in some way. They get hundreds and hundreds of comments from, you know, uh, either activists or people who are upset with the paper for, for whatever reason. And then some papers that are really bad, but have politics that people agree with, uh, don't get any comments at all or, or, or just one or two comments and no one pays any attention to them. Again, as I've said, though, previously, it doesn't matter. Like if the comments are if the comments are um, are actually pointing out genuine objective errors. It doesn't matter why people have pointed them out. If they're objective errors, then you've got to correct them. But um, I think the, I'm only saying this in that the reason such a thing doesn't exist or, or isn't more widespread is that I think journals would be worried that, you know, certain papers would get tons of tons and tons and tons of comments and they would have to then devote resources to moderating those comments. And you, you can see how that, you know, they are not incentivized 
to do that at all, even if it would help us get towards, you know, better quality results in the long run. Yeah, I mean, especially like the, the case that I have, I think ultimately there's probably something slightly wrong with the data. They made some, maybe the excluded trials didn't say they did. I, okay. It seems like a fairly benign error, I think. And well, I mean, if, what, one option you have is, is to, is to write a letter to the journal. Like some journals publish actual, you know, commentary letters. Some of them have stupid arbitrary rules, like you can only publish this within one year of the original article being published and all this, like, stupid things like that, where, like, yeah, oh, an error. Incorrect. There's a statute yeah. of limitations on scientific errors, apparently. But, um, but uh, uh, you know, some journals do have that option. Um, and, and, and the nice thing there is that you get a publication out of it because everyone loves a publication. So uh, 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 you actually get, you know, something on your CV. Yeah, I mean, I'll see. I, I think I'll, I'll pro- I still want to contact the authors first. And just see um, that's probably the best. what they do. That's also probably out of curiosity, to see what they do. And Nick, Nick Brown, the uh, fraud fraud busting uh, researcher, and I uh, we were talking about this a while ago, and, and some other people about writing an article of like what are the steps you should do when we want to correct a mistake in a scientific paper. Uh, you start with the authors, escalate to the editor, maybe the action editor, then the main editor of the journal, then their university, their university's scientific integrity office, their their the the you know there's a whole there's a whole the prime minister. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, before before you get to the prime minister, you can you could talk to the funding sources, maybe. Like, is is you know, do do they have any any way of dealing with uh, uh, errors? Um, not that we expect it would work in in every or indeed most cases, but but you know, um, people don't know what to do at all. And again, going back to the issue that we talked about before about open science, like just making things slightly easier to do is is going to yeah. you know, I think that would be super useful. I mean, I, you know, another, one of the reasons I contacted Joe is also, I, you know, I, I pointed out to some people in the lab, the errors, mm. gave a like lab presentation to like really show like what I think was wrong with it. And yeah. everyone went, yeah, this doesn't seem good. Don't know what to do though. Next. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Let's move on to the next thing. Cause we don't actually. Yeah. Like we're just, I know it seems important, but like, I don't know what, what, what would you do, do about that? In this yeah. Case. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. maybe we'll, um, maybe this conversation has encouraged me to go and talk to Nick about writing that paper again. <laughs> Hope so. Uh, okay, this is a very random comment I wrote down. Is um, I mean, this is right towards the end, but I didn't expect uh, in a book about science, problems with science, let's say, uh, to read about uh, Goretzky and Boulet. And Boulet. So congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> I thought it was a good. I thought it was a good example of someone who was obsessed with novelty. Uh, 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 and attacking attacking you know something which is boring i guess the the way that the analogy doesn't quite work is that the the, the boring symphony is extremely popular whereas in science uh, uh the boring stuff is not but the point was that among his particular clique uh, uh among the kind of avant-garde musicians that boring stuff was of no interest of no interest to anyone and and, and he shouted that it was shit at its, at its premiere and um and uh i thought it was a nice example of like scientists shouting at papers like mine when i did the replication study that oh this is just something dull you know we want something new we want something that really pushes the boundaries every single time and you know you can't you can't reliably push the boundaries every single time you've got to stop and consolidate uh, yeah, at some yeah. point and make sure that you're getting things right so that was the analogy i was trying to draw there is that um in science in, in art you might be able to constantly push the boundaries but in science you've got to consolidate at some point yeah, yeah. No, it's just I, I thought it was also an, an interesting analogy because I guess not only the piece but also the person. I would say. I mean, I don't know exactly what the. It's not even that modern anymore, right? They're both. No, they're both dead, right? I think. Uh, so. um, I sure. think they are both dead. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. Bull is dead. Anyway, like within that kind of scene, Pierre Boulez is a much, I assume, much more famous and much more established. And, uh, respected figure than what's his name Hendrik. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, but, yeah. He, uh, I, well, he had different. I mean, he was a his. I think his his composing stuff is 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 so difficult and 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 um, avant garde that people bully. Yeah, that people don't yeah. people don't really get it. Don't really understand it. Whereas his as a conductor, he was extremely well respected and yeah, yeah, and, and and kind of everywhere. But. Um, no, I mean, like, I, let's put it this way. I've, I considered becoming a classical musician and mm. I, um, in my teenage years and I like a lot of 20th century music. 
Hmm. Um, I will listen to a lot of it, but I have to say with Pierre Boulet, that's something where I feel like, yeah, I have to educate myself before I listen to this. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I have to, like some of his piano music, I think like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of interesting to listen yeah, to. I, but, I, I, yeah, I, I try... I I I, uh, I always try and listen. I always like try and keep an open mind for it. I, I I've never really clicked with his with his stuff. I um, there's a scene in there's a scene in The Sopranos where they're trying to they're trying to portray one of the characters as like a kind of very middle class person, and he's like sitting. I think he's reading Robert Nozick or something like that, and he's listening to uh the, one of the piano pieces by um, Pierre Boulez, and um, uh, it's like it's like a classic example of. They kind of up themselves, middle class person. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, this is um, also like why I didn't expect this is because this seems like a pretty. I'm not sure how many people really understood that analogy perfectly, or like got the context of it. Is that something that, I was just curious about the publisher? Did they comment on that and say like they took out no, loads no, of no scientist knows this about these people? <laughs> well, Goretzky they might, but I think actually there was a review that said I didn't understand the Goretzky thing at the end okay. there was a review that said that and i was like well think about harder but um yeah. but uh uh i will say one thing i was quite grateful for was that the editor um took out from the first draft the initial first draft took out basically every stupid joke or cultural reference that i had made there were he left a few in that one being one but uh the book is way better and it's a nice example of like writing is that you you write initially and it's almost like you write for yourself because you're like, oh, I'm quite yeah, pleased yeah. that I managed to make that cultural reference there. And then the editor just <laughs> comes along and just wipes all that stuff out, just gets rid of all of it. And uh, and, and because it's annoying and it dates the book and people don't quite get it and, and, and so on. So um, if you've seen the first draft, there was a lot more stuff like that in there. Uh, and, 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 you know, that particular part was was left in. But um, there was a lot more of just stuff like that, which I was upset at the time when I saw it getting deleted. But I'm very glad that it's gone now. And, you know, on second thoughts, it was a much better idea to get rid of all that stuff. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, I I, I was kind of by coincidence, I got that one. But yeah, probably wouldn't have got most of the others. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, anyway, um, in the book, you have these four main problems, fraud, bias, negligence and hype. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I'm not entirely sure why, but for some reason I find fraud really fascinating. Mm. There's something I find really fascinating about people putting in lots of effort to pretend to be someone they're not. And then there's something yeah. I find really fascinating about that. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit more about that part. Mm, sure. I think the, the kind of three most interesting cases, I think, are the, um, Stapel, Maccherini and Huang. No. Sure, I'm pronouncing all those correctly, but um, can you like brief? I don't know, maybe like a minute, however long you want, but briefly kind of summarize each case, and we kind of use that as a starting point. The reason I, uh, the reason that the first kind of of the four problems was fraud is that is that it, it, it's the most kind of lurid and exciting uh, aspect of this. I, you know, I love the, I love to read stories about this, and it's like it's you know the same the same uh, part of your brain that makes you interested in true crime uh stuff you know it makes you interested in scientific fraud i think uh, it's the same kind of like i can't believe someone did this it's really scary to think that the people are doing this uh and i love to you know everyone loves to watch a netflix documentary about true crime or, or whatever uh, yeah. and this is the science version of true crime yeah and yeah. um so yeah i mean the 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 Stapel case happened at the same time as the daryl bem thing was happening when i was trying to replicate the, this uh, parapsychology study it was an example of a Professor, a social psychology professor at Tilburg University in the Netherlands who had written loads of papers on all sorts of different topics uh, and some of them had gotten into not just psychology journals but but I mean one of them got into science so like a genuinely prestigious genuinely prestigious uh, journal that, that anyone would want to get published in um, and after a great deal of uh, stuff was published it turned out that he had made it all up like like he did it, uh, he had um, he would regularly meet his co-author, his colleagues in the in the uh, the coffee room, and they would say, "Oh, I'm kind of interested in this question, you know, X, Y, whatever variables." And he would say, "Ah, I actually ran a study on that just the other week. Uh, I'll bring you in the data tomorrow." And he would go <laughs> home that night, open up his laptop, and sit at the kitchen table into the early hours of the the, the morning, writing, uh, typing in the numbers that he wanted into an Excel spreadsheet. 
Um, and then he would come and say, look, here's the data. And he would give it to his colleagues and they would say, wow, there's amazing results here. He would sometimes give the data to his PhD students uh, uh, and several of them wrote PhD dissertations, which are entirely based on fraudulent data that they didn't know about that had been given to them by him. Um, but they started to become suspicious because like, why was he running the experiments and not getting his PhD students to do it? Is he not a busy professor? Why is he not delegating the experiments to them? And, and, there were, you know, and the results just seemed a little bit too good to be true. It turned out that he, you know, after after investigation, you know, he he kind of admitted that that he had that he had fraudulently made up the results in about fifty something papers, uh, all of which have been retracted. Um, and he is, I think, now the fifth or sixth most retracted researcher of all of all time that we that we you know that we know about. That's, That's really, the crazy really thing, right? He's, yeah, it's, he's number five. Yeah, uh, I think he's six now. He's been or six. He's but been he's uh, not number he's one. Been pipped, yeah. he's been pipped off. Yeah, no, exactly. There's 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 there there are way worse people. Um, I'm even close. Yeah, right. uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, and so that was an amazing example. And that happened around about the same time as the BEM thing. And that was kind of caused psychologists to sort of look inward and go like, why didn't nobody realize for so many years that his research had was, was so crap? And it turned out some people had tried to replicate his research, but had never got, been able to get it published because people don't like to publish replication studies or didn't back then. Uh, and very few people had ever questioned it. They'd kind of nodded it along. Yeah. You know, research on people who have a messy desk are, are are more likely to be racist. That was one of the that was one of the studies that he did. Um, just like cool stuff like that. Yeah, uh, uh, it gets a headline in the newspaper. It gets resources, you know, coming in from funders or to the university. And I mean, it really fits into the whole line of research that doesn't replicate, right? Yeah. Oh, it's in terms yeah. Of like yeah. No, it was, it the was way exactly, it sounds. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Easily understandable. Easy to make a headline. Easy to do. Um, uh, it turned out, even though it was easy to do, he didn't do it. Uh, he uh, he made up the he made up the the, the studies. Um, and uh, so that was an amazing example of you know scientific fraud in psychology. And there were several other examples that came out. Uh, uh, you know, after that, in the world of social psychology as well as as well as other areas. So that happened around about the same time as my experience with the Daryl Bem replication. Um, later, well, actually, the the, the Wusak Huang case, which is a, a stem cell case, was a, was a much bigger um, example of scientific fraud. It was in, in South Korea. Um, that was in about 2005, five six, I think, that all came out. That this, this researcher who was l- literally like mentioned on postage stamps uh, in, in South Korea, he was so famous, unbelievably famous, and he had apparently cloned was was beginning to like clone human feces with stem cells and be and you know regenerate organs. He did clone a dog. That was actually a genuine thing. He cloned the first ever dog uh, to be cloned, um, which was called Snuppy. I think was the dog's name because um, it's like s- 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 Snoopy. Uh, or what, but... Well, it was like it was the U. So maybe they pronounced it Snoopy, but it was like S N U, which is Seoul National University. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think um, something like that. Anyway, um, uh, anyway, he had this massive empire of fraud where he had been giving bribes to politicians and uh, uh, g- taking the money from research grants and letting, so from his grant, right? Yeah, 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 and giving yeah. giving his wife the money to buy a car and chalking it up to saying this was lab apparatus that was needed and uh, 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 you know endless uh, he, uh, and because he was because he was so, so popular and, and had seeming uh, you know seemed to making all these medical breakthroughs that would help people with you know problems you know diseases and so on uh, uh, in their or with with their organs and so on he was actually you know people wouldn't believe it for a long time people were out protesting against the the whistleblowers and and uh, leaving endless angry comments online whenever the, the story was 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 said that he was being persecuted in some way um and i think he narrowly avoided prison time and ended up doing research at some much oh. more do, doing research at some much more uh, low grade university after it all kind of after it all came out that so that's a um, crazy statement right yeah, he yeah, he was he was, time and is now at a less Yeah, he was university. just continuing to publish research. Yeah, yeah, no. It's, <laughs> it speaks to a broader issue which is like how do yeah, you punish yeah. how do you punish people who commit scientific fraud? In some cases, in some less extreme cases, like in the US for instance, sometimes the punishment is you can't apply for a research grant for one year after the after the fraud's been discovered. It's like is that really a a deterrent? Yeah. Is that really much of a punishment? They'll just take one year to write a better grant. <laughs> exactly. Some people lose their jobs. Some people, you know, uh, uh, and end up not not publishing in science anymore. But some people move on to a different university and continue publishing research there. Um, so, so 
that was that was in that was an interesting example of like he was a massive big deal. He was a huge, huge, huge success story, and it turned out that he was just faking all the data. The pictures in his papers had been photoshopped and 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 so on, and there were never there were never the, the the stem cell breakthroughs that he had claimed. And then and then the third one you mentioned, or the, the other one you mentioned, is is the case of Paolo Macchiarini, who um, is that's much more recent. In 2016 or so, that kind of all came out. I think um, he was a surgeon at. Well, he was recruited by the Karolinska Hospital, which is part of the Karolinska Institute, which is the yeah. university in Stockholm that uh, it gives out the Nobel Prize for physiology and medicine. So it's a big deal to get a phone call from 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 there, and you'd think they would have very high standards in the scientists that they uh, recruit, but they don't. It turns out, and uh, or at least they didn't in this case. They recruited a guy who claimed to be able to do a full, uh, well, claimed to, claimed to do a, a windpipe transplant. Of a of a of an artificial windpipe. So rather than taking the organ from a dead body, which is rare to get, and giving it to someone who's maybe got cancer or some kind of issue that's caused their windpipe to have to be removed um, or damaged in some way, instead of taking it from a dead body, you can build one in a. You know, he he claimed that you could build a windpipe in this special kind of almost incubator machine that you would seed with people's stem cells, so that when you put the organ in, it wouldn't be rejected by their immune system. Uh, and he had breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. On, on 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 this saying that the patients that he had operated on and given them these artificial uh, tracheas were um were were extremely healthy and recovering well and so on and the, the it turns out that the scientific papers just contain uh, falsehoods about the medical records of the of the participants right so they he claimed that they were recovering well but in fact some of them were dead but like before the papers were even published that some of them had died uh, recovering very very poorly huge infections uh, uh re- re- you know going needed to go back for further surgery um horrible really tragic harrowing stories of people with you know like pus filled wounds like, like holes in their chest like pouring out uh, uh, all these fluids and so on because he had just done such a terrible job of of these of these operations and you know that sort of thing it's bad enough, but another kind of side to the story was the, the way that the institutions covered up for him. So not just the Karolinska Institute, which after they had employed someone to check whether he was a scientific fraud and writing incorrect stuff in his papers. And by the way, it wasn't just these papers. There were other papers where he had falsified data on like rats that he had uh, that he had done an experiment on. Um, he was also the guy who had like a second wife or something that's right well that's not i mean that's like the third side of the story yeah but the second side is that the institutions covered up for him the karolinska institute rejected the reports of an independent uh uh, researcher that they brought in to check whether he had committed fraud who said by the way he has committed fraud they brought in this independent researcher who said uh he's definitely committed fraud but they said we've, we've actually done our own investigation which you can't see and we think it's all fine the lancet the journal that he published in published this kind of crowing editorial saying he's been exonerated and hasn't committed scientific fraud. Uh, by the way, you know, um, uh, you know, people should be a lot less suspicious, blah, blah, blah. Um, and if, you know, a few months later, after loads more stuff came out, they had to climb down embarrassingly and say, actually, we, we have published a fraudulent paper by this guy. And um, uh, yeah, and as you say, there's like his personal life was full of weird con man style stuff as well where he was married to a, a woman with kids but was also dating this nbc news producer at the time who he told that he would marry her and told that he was the pope's doctor and that the pope would do their wedding and that barack obama was coming and that elton john was going to give was going to do the music like like <laughs> obvious fraud con man type stuff in his personal life and in his science. And unfortunately, you know, the personal life stuff obviously was extremely hurtful for the person who he was kind of yeah. victimizing. But in the science, it actually caused people to die, you know. And and, and um, he got sacked, but then started working in Russia, uh, continuing to do some research. But then I think he got kind of his uh, his funding got spiked in Russia as well. And I don't actually know where he is currently and what, what he's doing right now. Uh, certainly hasn't been publishing stuff, I don't think, for, for, for a while. Although he did go on publishing after all the allegations came out. So three examples of where, you know, um, people have made up data or heavily manipulated data or, you know, um, uh, done other sort of nefarious stuff with data. And it's it's kind of the opposite of what you would want to happen. And in the case of the, the, the Macarini thing, you would want the institutions of science to kind of 
open up and say, look, we're investigating this guy. We're going to be very careful. We think there's some serious problems here. Uh, but instead, they defended him way after it was reasonable to 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 to, to do so. Um, and you can see why, right? Nobody wants to believe that someone that they've published or that they've employed has committed scientific fraud and may even have killed patients with the dodgy scientific experiments he was doing. Um, you can see why they would have, you know, a, a sort of mindset against believing that. Uh, so yeah, three stories there of uh, of, of kind of upsetting uh, scenarios where it took way too long for the scientific fraud to be discovered, and um, I'm sure there's lessons there about how maybe scientists and and you know I say this in the book it, it doesn't sound nice, but maybe scientists should have a little bit less trust for each other. Uh, the whole point of yeah. doing science is that you take nobody's word for it and that you you know are dispassionately looking through the data at all times and so on. In 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 a lot of these cases, people just took. Uh, you know, Diederik Stapel's data sets on 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 faith, uh, and and believed them way, you know, before they before they had actually checked anything about whether the data were actually realistic or not. Yeah. Um, by the way, is there for 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 Stapel? Is there anything? I mean, I'm <laughs> you know, I'm not really interested in the in the people's personal lives, but what I find interesting is that Macarini and Huang. Both seem to just be, as we say, general fraudsters mm. or whatever. Um, it seemed like science was just one branch of kind of what they did. Um, is there anything for Stapel or not? I don't. I don't know. Uh, well, you can read. You can read his uh, memoir, autobiography, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, which he which he published um, after it all everything all came out. And I think um, no, I don't think he. I think you know he's married and 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 so on, and didn't seem to have any. Um, didn't seem to have any like weird things like trying to marry a second person at the same time like Macarini did. Um, so no, I don't think there's anything like him. But but I I suspect um, it's like one of these situations where if you find that someone has done something like fraud or plagiarism or whatever, you can check their other stuff and find that they've that they've done it elsewhere. In the case of Huang and uh, and uh, uh, Macarini, that bled out into their personal lives. I'm not sure quite the same thing happened with with Staple, but it was certainly the case that it bled out into almost all the research that he ever touched yeah yeah i mean like what i'm kind of interested in and kind of why i asked that question is also it seems so that, you know we can we can do lots of things to prevent fraud right i mean you mentioned a lot of the techniques hmm. um and some of the people who invented them um in i mean you mentioned in the book and some of the people we already mentioned in our conversation um you know you can you can do the the grim testing hmm. by um james heathers and nick brown and I used actually, I mean, I tried to do that for the paper that I found, but I was too stupid to use it. But I used the same kind of logic and principles behind it to right. do that. And right. that I found something like that too with that. Okay. But, um, you know, you can do that and you can have open science. And you, there's all these things you can do. But I wonder, like, with, with people like Juan and Macchiarini and Starper, it seems to me like, is there anything you can do about people who so systematically and effortful defraud a system i mean it seems like you know that that's just gonna happen right people are just gonna yeah yeah i think we'll always have people like this around but i think we can uh we can set up a system to to deal with it more adequately so i mean one thing is that we can have random or systematic checks with those kinds of things you're talking about this the fraud spotting algorithm type things when people submit articles to journals that's one thing I think just get, just asking people to post their data online is, is 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 going to be helpful. If not, I mean, it's not going to catch every case. And as I say, there have been cases where people have posted data online and it had turned out to be fraudulent, uh, which is amazing. Uh, Although, just briefly, I I think the first question I asked Joe Hilgard is, could you do it? Could you fake a data set and publish it and not get away with it? He's mm. sure. Yeah, difficult. no, of, of course, of course, <laughs> there'll always be people like that. And and the scary question, which I you know I, I mentioned towards the end of the fraud chapter of the book, is. There must be people out there who we will just never find because yeah. they've successfully covered their tracks. I mean, we'll never know. We found those three, or I mean, we, I didn't do anything. The reason those three people were found is that they were big, famous people mm. with interesting lives, right? Lots of attention, lots of attention on them and so on. And exactly. They were... There must be lots and lots of people who, in a way, are smarter, who just yeah. go for the successful route totally. and not I, the super successful route. I totally think that that is that that is uh, not just not just not just possible but 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 probable that we're missing out on loads of cases of that um, and if they're listening right now congratulations yeah, <laughs> well, well yeah nice one. I, I hope you're not doing medical <laughs> research i hope you're doing some like area of social psychology or something that, that that's never going to impact the real world yeah um uh but but um yeah i think we we you know the the system we have at the moment um 
where, for instance, peer reviewers are under endless time pressure to 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 get stuff done. They're not paid anything. They're um, uh, themselves got loads of stuff to do, loads of loads of research and, and and teaching and whatever else. They're rushed off their feet. The more time they spend, you know, doing uh, all this other stuff, the, the less time they've got to do peer review. And so, um, I think we've got to change the way that we do peer review to allow people to have more time to take it easy and to, to, to just think about the, the, the look at the data, think about the paper, um, having fully replicable workflows and stuff is going to help there as well. Just being totally transparent. If you've got nothing to hide, then you can, you can do, you can, you can share everything with, with the, with the people that are reading your paper. Um, yeah, I think there are lots of things like that, that you could, you could institute right at the very start to make it less likely that people would get away with it. But I think there will always be smart fraudsters and so on. Um, but I think the answer to that is to do things like encouraging independent labs to replicate findings uh, and, and, to, and, and you know, all these kind of collaborative efforts where people have come along and done a survey of replication studies, I think, have, have been really useful because they've, they've uncovered a few cases where, you know, maybe the original study was not, was not particularly, you know, well done or was, was, was p-hacked or whatever it is. So... Uh, I think changing the 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 general culture towards one where people are being transparent and are thinking all the time about you know I want to just I want to just I just want to double check this I want to just double check this um, will make it will will not eradicate fraud but it'll be a, an atmosphere where fraud is less likely to kind of grow. And another thing which I've previously mentioned is is actually punishing people where it's found right. So not just you can't just you can't apply for another grant for a year, but 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 actually making really severe punishments um uh, and i'm not quite sure what those would be in, in in within science but in some cases where people have misappropriated actual you know money they, they could be criminally prosecuted if they've, they've taken taxpayers money and and basically defrauded the taxpayer then uh, i'm not sure why that's different from someone who steals um from a bank or 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 from someone's wallet in the street or whatever um uh yeah, i'm not sure why basic- tax fraud or something uh, right exactly exactly you're you're stealing from the you're stealing from the taxpayer so yeah i think there's the kind of the stick end where you want harsher punishments i think and there's also the carrot end. and also by the way naming and shaming people and stuff is can be very effective and then there's the there's the there's the the kind of more friendly end which is making the it's not friendly but it's it's the more positive end it's making science more open and transparent in order to shine some light on all those corners where the fraud the fraud is happening and uh, and and make it less likely that people can get away with it um but but it's not it's not it's not easy and there's no there's no actual quick fix to this to this question um you'll always have people who are looking to defraud the system even in a pandemic we've seen people committing what amounts to scientific fraud um in order to publicize one treatment or another or, uh, or criticize a treatment that they don't like and um, we've seen examples of that so even in a case where the stuff that they're doing will directly lead to you know uh, medical treatments and maybe you know people's lives being at risk they're still committing fraud so this is not something where we can just appeal to people not to do it or whatever we have to change the way that the system works um to make it less likely one thing i'm I'm asking myself is, so this is, I mean, this is a more general point. It's basically how much effort do we want to put into fighting fraud? Um, I mean, like maybe one, a different way of thinking about this is that, for example, I think that in Germany, um, where I'm right now, the, the, sis, the, the kind of general administrative system is usually set up to make it really hard to commit fraud, but also you have a lot more work for everyone else, basically. So you have your, the administrative system is a lot more burdensome for everyone Mm -hmm. and you know that means you only have let's say a one percent chance of an error happening um but it's a lot lot more work for example in the uk i find in general it seemed to me people were more happy to say let's say we have a 95 percent chance of no error happening uh, no fraud being committed or something so it's more likely that something bad's going to happen but you like half the amount of effort that everyone has to put into the system so i'm curious like what do you how much do we actually want to try and get rid of fraud and how much is it just a waste of time almost? In, yeah, in it's an interesting question that um, has come up in the context recently of uh, government, the UK government buying COVID tests, um, for instance. So like at the start of the pandemic, the UK government bought loads and loads of COVID tests, including some from this particular company, which it wasn't necessarily fraud, but it, well, maybe it was. I don't know. It's hard to read people's intentions. But there were a company where no one had ever actually tested the 
the stuff that they, you know, the, the tests that they had, whether they actually measured COVID. Turned out they didn't. Uh, they were very low quality. Um, big claims were made for the accuracy of these tests, which were just not based on reality. And yet we paid them millions and millions of pounds of taxpayers' money. In that emergency situation, however, it's fine to be defrauded a little bit probably because you're you're casting the net widely and you're trying to get lots of different technologies in to try and address this, you know, pressing emergency problem. But I think that's that's a very specific situation where you, we just we needed to get this right. Any minimal quality control would have caught the fact that there were no actual efficacy trials of these tests and no one really knew whether they worked or not. Uh, so that's you know one example of where you might not care because you're in such a rush and you just want you just want to get the right thing done. But I think when it comes to the scientific record, we can't let these things lie. The scientific record there's a principle here, right? The scientific record is supposed to be a record of true things, whether they might be mistaken because they were came about through luck or chance or whatever then that's that's fine but it's a record of all the, the things that we did um that we that we think are true or at least are how the experiment was 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 carried out so we need to have much better ways of dealing with it and i think it really does matter um if we if we care about science not just because medical papers might get out into the literature and make doctors or surgeons do things differently and kill their patients obviously that's a big problem and that has happened in some fraud cases i think um, or in cases like the Andrew Wakefield's fraud paper, where the uh, you know it, it it gave lots of resources to the anti-vaccine movement in terms of intellectual resources, you know, uh, uh, and sparked off a huge scare. But I think there's a there's a there's a larger principle at, at stake, which is we need the scientific record to be correct. We need the scientific record to be uh, uh, an accurate. Uh, description of what was done and if we stop caring about whether it's right or not then we get back into the realm of like just being bullshitters again um uh we we you know we 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 are allowing people to come along a new generation of scientists to come along and read this literature that's full of uh of 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 uh, of, of results which may or may not be correct and that's not good enough so maybe the example i'm uh, let's say that, um i mean in principle of course i agree <laughs> uh, you know we don't want fraud but sure. i wonder to what extent it's just the the effort of eliminating fraud actually in the in the big picture uh reduces how much good we're doing i mean let's like one very silly example is that when we uh in the, in the old lab we were in in hamburg we wanted to do an online study and um, for some reason, it seems no one at our institute had actually done that. I mean, we were more neuroscience lab uh, institute hmm. um, where people do use MRI rather than behavioral, lots of behavioral testing. But so we were the first people who had to kind of justify to the, um, the, the budget department or whatever, why we're using, why we're spending this money to this company called Prolific that they'd never heard of. Oh, yeah. And, you know, this is the kind of thing where, it would have taken us maybe two minutes, let's say five minutes, to just you know use our own credit card, put the money over, and then uh, get it back afterwards. But because it wasn't like officially allowed or something, we had to first you know ask what, for it to be allowed for us to do that basically. Mm. And then and then so basically what happened is we probably spent like an, a week's worth of effort of trying to figure out how we can contact, then writing the kind of thing and justifying why we're doing this. Then every time we want a new payment, we have to ask them again and they have to put it in. Then it takes another week for them to do it, et cetera, et cetera, right? So sure. it's this really lengthy process. Yeah, yeah, And at some point I went just like, I don't care if someone like defrauds the system for like a few thousand euros <laughs> as long as I don't have to deal with this. Yeah, I, uh, what you're describing there is not necessarily like a good process of catching fraud. It's a, it, that What you're describing there is 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 bullshit institutional red tape right and, and and no one's in support of that yeah no one cares about institutional red tape uh no one wants to, there to be institutional but red isn't tape. it isn't it though a way to eliminate fraud to say like okay these research funds we know exactly what you're using it for hmm. um and if and you know i can see why they do it but it's an argument for streamlining that process it's an argument for making that process easier uh i don't know the specifics of how it works so i you know i can't think of a, yeah, a yeah, particular yeah. way of making it of making it better but it's so that's an argument for doing that rather than not having checks at all and not caring about fraud because the problem is these are very like tail end cases but every so often you will get someone coming along like Macarini or 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 Wang or whatever who will um who will commit you know massive scientific fraud and and it will not just you know it could it could kill patients it could uh, um uh, pollute the scientific literature and it could also make it look really bad for 
scientists in general and, 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 and kind of reduce public trust in science. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why we don't want, why we should care about catching scientific fraud and why I find it weird that we, that we don't in many cases, like we, that we, that we seem to not have that many resources dedicated to dealing with scientific fraud. So, um, yeah, I I, uh, I I agree with you in, in that that um, there are some kind of emergency cases where it might be you know fine to be defrauded a little bit as long as as long as it means that you're keeping continuing moving. But um, I think Just those cases like are costs, quite few and far between. Uh, for like a benefit cost analysis, like in that case, I wonder like how much you can you know the amount of like hours put into hmm. running the system being costing more than the occasional fraud well the problem is at the moment the system for catching fraud there isn't really one and and, and it takes people right. all this time all these resources and so on whereas if we had better fraud prevention measures in the first place we probably wouldn't need so often at least to get to the point where people are spending hours and hours and hours of unpaid time investigating these investigating these papers um with the, the the weird data would have been caught out already or 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 whatever um, but yeah, I, I agree that there will come a point where being obsessive, obsessively focusing on fraud, will um, will mean that we um, will mean that we stop being able to do research as quickly or as efficiently as we did before. Um, but I think we, that would have to be—you'd have to set the bar quite. Uh, I think I think I I, I I I think we should care an awful lot about whether scientific fraud is in the literature and um you would have to make quite a strong argument for a cost benefit thing about you know we'd have to somehow we'd have to somehow quantify the benefit of not having scientific fraud in the literature which i think is is really important yeah and i guess i mean so this um this is kind of like the last kind of topic i want to open up or um i think a lot of these things maybe can be also addressed with fairly simple things like it being fine for no results to be published so then like yeah. a lot of failed replications won't come up but this kind of so this relates to like the last one i wanted to make which was um so one thing i kept wondering whilst whilst reading your book is that like you know you 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 talk a lot about these individual solutions right um like you know we've mentioned enough of them already hmm. um so i'm not going to repeat them now but do you think like a bunch of small things is going to do the job or does it need like a, a revolution in that sense? Um, um, well, it depends on what you mean by revolution. I think probably science will end up, if, if we move towards making science better, we'll end up looking very different from how it looks right now. Like we wouldn't maybe have the same journal system. We wouldn't have the same system of putting your research online, publishing your research, doing your research, you know, uh, if, we're, if we're going to go down the route of, you know, the registered report and so on. But revolution in the sense that we should just upend the system right now and completely replace it with new things i think is a bad idea given that we're all scientists here and we want to test whether things that we're doing will actually improve the quality of, of, of research so i think there's a there's a there's a strong argument for having a long period of experimentation with new ways of doing research new ways of publishing research new ways of doing peer review new ways of evaluating research whatever it is at whatever point along the the line where we do much more meta scientific research collect high quality meta scientific data and really test, whether it's in randomized controlled trials or some other clever way of testing, um, new ways of doing science and and how robust, replicable, important, uh, whatever each research finding is. We do not want to end up in a situation where we institute a new system which has all these unknown knowns or whatever, uh, uh, unknown unknowns, yeah, unknown, unknown. Which, which ruin the... Which which ruins science in a in a in a perhaps not exactly the same way as it's being ruined right now, but in a different in a different way entirely. So you know, as I say, we're all scientists. Let's do some research on what makes things better, rather than having a massive revolution and just changing it to the way that we want it to go right now. Let's let's be humble about the fact that we need to test that too. 